Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium. My name is Todd Hartley. I'm the executive producer at Breast Cancer Answers. And what an honor it is to be here right now bringing you the latest news and information as it trickles out here in San Antonio. Now, one of the biggest stories that I heard, I'm holding right here in my hand, and it comes from MD Anderson's Cancer Center, imagine that, and there, the, here's the title, African American women with breast cancer less likely to have newer recommended surgical procedures. That's what MD Anderson found in a recent study, and the author of that study well, she sits right back here with Dr. Harness. So they're going to talk in just a moment. I want you to know if you'd like to submit in a question. You could be on BreastCancerAnswers.com. You could be on the Breast Cancer site, the National Consortium of Breast Centers, or any of the sites that are playing this live video feed to patients, loved ones, and advocates all over the web. Just go to BreastCancerAnswers.com in the top right corner there's a box you can type in the question and it'll, I'll, if it's relevant I'll bring it up to the panel alright so here we go Dr. Jay Harness past president of the American Society of Breast Surgeons is sitting down with Dr. Dahlia Mason Black she's the assistant professor in MD Anderson's Department of Surgical Oncology I will duck out of the way and let their conversation begin Dr. Harness thank you Todd Hey, Dahlia. Hi. Good to have you Good here. To be here. And I hear that we're welcoming you to the MD Anderson family, right? Yes, yes. I've been there for a year. Yeah, yes. yeah. Congratulations. Thank you. So one of the things that I had privy to was press releases prior to coming here that were embargoed. And yours particularly caught my eye. Mm -hmm. As I was sharing with you before we went live, I've spent a huge part of my career in disparate care and have known about some of these kinds of uh, inadequacies that have gone on historically uh, for any of the, of the disparate groups. Sure. You focused here on African Americans. Why don't we share with our lay audience out there, A, what a sentinel lymph node biopsy is, mm -hmm. and B, what you found in your study. Sure, so the sentinel node biopsy is a minimally invasive surgery to stage the axilla for early breast cancers. So breast cancers, if they spread, they'll most commonly go to the lymph nodes under the arm first. Yep. And it used to be that we would do an axillary node dissection. And that big term means, means what? Means we would remove all of the lymph nodes right. underneath the arm. Right. And are there consequences to doing that? There are. There are short-term complications and long-term complications. Long-term complications most commonly is lymphedema, and that is arm swelling. Right. That can cause pain, heaviness. Um, swelling, it can be temporary or permanent, and it's a quality of life issue for women. Yeah. It's fairly common and can be between 10 to 25 percent um, of, of women can report this that have the full axillary surgery. So the, the sentinel no biopsy was developed to prevent the major complications associated with the bigger surgery. Right. And to also allow us to stage the cancer as well, right? Correct. To know if that, and that often has uh, consequences in how we organize our treatment and things like that. Right. And so that surgery is, is applicable for patients with early small breast cancers and who don't have any suspicious lymph nodes on physical exam. So it's for early stage breast cancer patients. Okay. Yeah. So tell us about your study and what prompted you, well, let's get into what prompted you to do the study in the sure. first place. So uh, as a breast surgeon, I'm interested in how disparities relate specifically to what I do, breast cancer surgery. Mm -hmm. And so I was interested in how we, as we develop new techniques and new surgeries for breast cancer patients, is it being equitably distributed amongst minority populations? Um, and the sentinel node biopsy is one example of this question. How long has that procedure been around? Probably? So the sentinel node biopsy originally, you know, started in other types of cancers, but for breast cancer started in the early 90s being evaluated. Right. Um, it became really um, distributed throughout the um, surgical community in the early 2000s to mid 2000s. Yep, I would agree with you. Mm -hmm. So then the question becomes, did it get distributed equally out there for people having access, correct? Correct, right. So we know that disparities <laughs> exist in other 
areas of breast cancer care, such as breast cancer diagnosis, are minority patients more likely to get a, a mammogram? Do they have the same access to care? Um, do they as often get chemotherapy and other types of treatment? But this was a surgical question. And so we looked at a large uh, national uh, database called the SEER Medicare database. Mm -hmm. And we looked at over 31,000 women who were distributed throughout the United States um, and looked at black and white patients. Um, the study, there weren't a lot of other races to include. Right. So um, Hispanic patients were only about 330. So we just chose the two largest sure. groups. So that sure. would be uh, Caucasian women and African American women. But that study, we looked at the database from 2002 to 2007, and 2007 is the latest information that's out for us to evaluate. And we found that black women were less likely to have this newer sentinel node biopsy compared to white women with a 12% difference. Um, so what did that translate to? If they didn't get the sentinel node, does that mean they got more of the axillary full surgery then? Correct, right. Okay. So those patients, um, right, would have received the axillary lymph node dissection. And someone may say, well, so what? Who cares? Uh, no, well, you and I both know the so what is not right. fair, is it? Correct, right. So someone may say they got the bigger surgery and at least they got the information. We know their lymph nodes are evaluated and they didn't have any metastasis, so we got the information and who cares? But what we also looked at was the uh, risk of lymphedema, that arm swelling, yep. and if patients had the bigger uh, unnecessary surgery, did they then have a negative clinical impact because of that. And so the study showed that if black patients had a sentinel node biopsy, that they had the same lymphedema risk as white patients having a sentinel node there biopsy. So if they were treated with appropriate surgery, they did not have an adverse clinical uh, outcome. But if they had the bigger surgery, the axillary node dissection, there was a doubling in lymphedema. Dolly, what do you think? How can we reverse that? That's my first question to you. And my second question is, when you looked at the distribution of where African American women are, were treated, was there a difference between urban and rural? So, and, that, and the SEER data may not have it. Right. I don't know that. I'll, I'll take the second question first. Okay. So we're still examining <clears throat> the data based on geographic location. So um, of the sites that participate in the SEER Medicare data. Louisiana had the lowest at about 58% central no biopsy, and Seattle did great at about 89% central no biopsy use. But we haven't yet evaluated these geography, these locations by race. Um, we know that patients who are in regions with lower income, lower education, and <coughs> patients who live in areas that have less surgeons we're less, off, we're less likely to get the sentinel node biopsy. So I'm going to present to you the magic wand. Mm -hmm. All right. Taking what you've learned from your study, clearly the, the community out there should be asking for sentinel node procedures would Correct. be one thing. So part of this is educating the community to be asking for this procedure. But anything else do you think we can do to, to reverse the trend that you've found or the facts that you found? Right. So I don't think we can put the entire responsibility on the patient. It is appropriate for patients right. to advocate for themselves when right. they're diagnosed with the breast cancer yep. and to know the appropriate questions to ask their surgeons and other healthcare providers what their options are in the surgery and the complications associated with surgery and why the surgeon is recommending that treatment. But there's also a responsibility and a role that we play as surgeons and healthcare providers. And so as new technologies are recommended through our national committees, we have to make sure that those recommendations are implemented throughout all of the communities in the United States. Do you have any, any ideas on how we do that? I, mean, I know, that's a general yeah, statement. Yeah. So um, we will probably have to develop a tool that's almost you, that primary care doctors use. And so they have 15 minutes to see a patient and they have to have sometimes a checklist and a reminder. You know, this patient, remind this patient to get a mammogram, remind this patient that blood sugars need to be whatever mm -hmm. for diabetes. And so a modeling tool may have to be created or disseminated that can be used throughout uh, a, a community hospital, an academic center, or wherever a patient may be to make sure that the 
recommendations are being at least thought about and discussed with each breast cancer patient. Boy, I agree with you completely. I mean, uh, I don't know if you're a member of the American Society of Breast Surgeons I yet. And yes, of I know Funda, who we're going to be talking to, mm -hmm. is one of our leaders mm -hmm. there. Uh, but, you know, it, it's almost passe in a sense to be talking anymore about sentinel node biopsy at right. the level that you and I are used to. So it's really getting out more at the deep grassroots level, it sounds Correct. like, doesn't it? Right. More work needs to be done that way. And we are um, interested to see if this disparity hopefully is closing um, as the SEER Medicare uh, updated uh, data comes out. We're going to evaluate, and hopefully the, the gap in between the two is hopefully closing. Now, because this is Medicare data, this is women then that are 65 and older. Correct. And as you and I both know, there is a disproportionate number of younger African-American women who have breast cancer. So we don't really have data on them, do Correct, we? right. So, right. And, and so I, I'm sitting here, my wheels are spinning, thinking maybe we can talk to CMS about the 65 and older, but we really need to be also focused on the younger African-American. That's a good know? point. That's true. Yeah, very mm -hmm. good. Thank you. Anything else you'd like to share with, uh, are you going to be doing other kinds of studies like this in the future? So, right. So we want to see whether we want to update this data, see if the disparity still exists. Okay. We actually, there's some ways that you can actually evaluate the surgeon's role in this process. So okay. um, there's some coding where you can determine whether the surgeon had specialty fellowship training yep. in surgical oncology, the age of the surgeon. So we can look at some surgeon identifiers. And so we want to hopefully be able to identify um, areas that we can target. Okay, very good. Um, in the we're, we're going to assume for a second that maybe some people are just now tuning in. Mm -hmm. And so in another minute or so, Dahlia, how, what's the best way to summarize your study and then an action item for the folks who may be watching this sure. at home? For patients with early stage breast cancers, um, a sentinel node biopsy is a minimal surgery to determine whether there's uh, metastasis in the axilla. All patients should be, all any of those patients should be considered for a central no biopsy so that they'll benefit from less complications and the best cancer care wow. outcomes. Okay, very good. So, Todd, I think it's just been fantastic uh, having Dahlia having you, you here. You. Uh, welcome. I'm not even a member of the MD Anderson community, but welcome Thank to the you. MD Thank Anderson you for inviting community. Me and and, and uh, we'll hopefully, hopefully get, get this uh, out there and the word out there more. Congratulations for such a good study. Thanks very much. Todd, I'll turn it back to you. Well, that was Dr. Jay Harness having a really nice conversation about the new study that was released by MD Anderson. The study found out that African-American women with breast cancer are less likely to have newer recommended surgical procedures. What a shame. Really nice that we brought it, brought it to everybody's attention. Now sitting down with Dr. Jay Harness is Funda Merrick Bernstrom. She is um, MDFACS and she's with MD Anderson Cancer Center. And I will turn the floor over to Dr. Jay Harness. Well, Tom, people may not know what an FACS is. I'm winging it, Jay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you got to bear okay. with me. People at home say, what is that? Is that from? <laughs> <laughs> it sounds fancy. That's where I was. I got here and I said, well, I guess I started off saying it wrong. Why are you going to argue that? It's not a problem. So FACS means Fellow of the American College of Surgeons. So I'm welcome. Uh, as I was saying, uh, when Funda was sitting over on the sidelines over there and I went, yes, for the American Society of Breast Surgeons, Swenda has been one of our very dynamic leaders in our organization. And, and publicly, I want to thank you for all of your energy and hard work and things like that. Okay? Thank you. I'm, it's an honor to be part of the American Society of Breast Surgeons. Yeah, it is. It's a great group. So when I ran into you yesterday or the day before or whatever it was, I'm losing track of time now. Uh, one of the really big news items from the MD Anderson is the so-called moonshot. And I thought it would be fascinating for the folks at home to know more about this. You've got a lot of PR about it, but tell us a little bit about the moonshot that the MD Anderson is working on. Yeah, the moonshot actually is a really exciting initiative. And I have to say, um, uh, very bold, very... Uh, um, driven in that, you know, as a team, 
uh, a large number of people had been put together for each disease site to internally compete at MD Anderson to select out diseases where we feel we can genuinely make an impact over the next 10 years and improve outcomes. So the term moonshot, mm -hmm. yeah, you're too young to remember this. But I, <laughs> I, I hear re something I about going to the moon. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I remember when President Kennedy mm -hmm. said by the end of the decade, I'm not even sure Todd was alive back then either, but anyway, uh, I remember very well when President Kennedy said by the end of the decade, we're going to put a man on the moon. And so that's... I think where this is all coming That's from, exactly it was a right. very bold effort. Exactly I mean, people right. People were just like, "Wow!" and we did it. Yeah, we actually did it. So is that is that, that part of the derivation that, of all that's this? That's definitely you know I think having definite timelines and a pressure that already exists in our minds because we want to make a difference yep. rapidly. However, recognizing that we need to have a very systematic approach to figure out what is feasible short term, what is feasible and will genuinely impact outcomes is really critical. So nope. in this case, what we did is um, we put together a moonshot team that's focused on the women's cancers. And actually, this is a combination with the gynecological oncologists and the breast cancer team. And we're focusing on two diseases that are similar at a molecular level. Okay. serious ovarian cancer yep. and triple negative breast cancer. Yep. And I think many of you know this, but triple negative breast cancer refers to a, a breast cancer t subtype where there's no estrogen receptor, no progesterone receptor, and no HER2 receptor. And this is very relevant because now we've made you know, significant progress in two, the other two major subtypes of breast cancer, the hormone receptor positive, so estrogen receptor or progesterone receptor positive patients, derive benefit from estrogen receptor targeted therapies, right. and there's several of them, and we're making uh, significant progress in figuring out who needs additional therapy, what kind of therapy, and for HER2 positive cancers, right. there's been a large amount of progress made with multiple new drugs actually going into um, the clinic recently. However, the triple negative breast cancer patients unfortunately have a more aggressive type and we don't have a specific targeted therapy to offer yeah, them. Funda, how, I, and I'm not sure I can answer mm -hmm. this question mm -hmm. myself, but how did we sort of stumble upon the fact that ovarian at the molecular level and triple negatives can have some real similarities to Yeah, it? so there were some components that we were already aware of, but I think over the last couple of years, one of the <laughs> things that really highlighted this was, for example, the TCGA mm -hmm. effort. Uh, many of you may have seen a lot of press over the uh, the series of papers that came out of this large consortium looking at the molecular characteristics of tumors. And this is a very important NIH initiative. And uh, recently, when they published the breast cancer molecular characterization, they highlighted again the fact that there's a lot of commonality between triple negative breast cancer at a molecular level and uh, the uh, serious ovarian cancer. And as you also know, many of the BRCA patients yes. are also <clears throat> triple negative, aren't they? Yeah, so that's, yeah. A very, there, that's another very important link. Right. So strategies where we can better characterize and identify patients that have a, a, a hereditary component of this will help us um, better prevent and maybe better treat those patients. So that's another area we're actively working together with a gynecological okay. group to routinely screen for you know, genetic alterations. I, I'm, I'm confident that people at home are sitting there applauding, standing, jumping out of their chairs over your effort. And like President Kennedy said, but by the end of the decade, yes. what kind of timelines do we have on the moonshot? Yeah, so we're under a lot of pressure, let's <laughs> just say, from a timeline standpoint, <laughs> because we really want to have deliverables right away. Yeah. So uh, we're spending the next few months organizing to try to figure out which are the priority items where we feel we can genuinely make an impact. Okay. But uh, some of the things that we're strongly looking at is uh, uh, trying to better 
design treatments uh, so that we can routinely characterize tumors in patients that have breast cancer, triple negative breast cancer, and ovarian cancer, so we can identify specific treatments that will be more efficacious. Are you now, optimistic for, about all this? I, I'm very optimistic. Well, honey, you're always optimistic. <laughs> That's why I like hanging out with well, you. Well, that, it's true, <laughs> but you know, currently the only treatment we have from a systemic treatment standpoint yeah. for triple negative breast cancer is chemotherapy, yeah. and uh, you know. Triple negative breast cancer is actually fairly chemosensitive. Yeah. However, uh, only 30 to 40 percent of patients have complete uh, appear disappearance of tumor if you were to give the chemotherapy while the tumor is still in the breast. Yep. That's what we call pathological complete response. Right. We are looking at different treatment modalities for patients that don't achieve that there benefit, and uh, especially for patients that have tumor yeah. recurrence. And, and to not use the big fancy word, but I will. Uh, we know that cancer, cancers are very heterogeneous, yes. meaning the cells that are within the cancer can be really different, and that our chemotherapy may initially destroy the easy ones, if mm -hmm. you will, but what's left are the really resistant ones. Back to one of the papers here at San Antonio is about the molecular profiling of those residual resistant cells. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming that at the MD Anderson, you guys will be looking at stuff like that because it's those rascals that are left at the end yes. that are the real real culprits here. Yeah, think. we have a very large program actually focusing at the residual disease in the breast and doing right. molecular characterization. Right. But, you know, Dr. Artiago's lab did a very nice uh, study looking at that as well. So that's one of the areas that we're specifically focusing on, looking at what are the specific molecular alterations that exist in those tumors that are resistant yep. and also those patients that yep. you know in the tumors that are metastatic right. so we can have specific treatments or combinations of treatments that will be effective in different tumor types okay. so that we can better match the treatments okay. we deliver to the molecular okay. characteristics now there may be some folks that just joined us here in the last couple of minutes and didn't catch all what's sort of the take-home message about the moonshot at, at uh, the MD Anderson that people can remember how would you best summarize this it's uh, it's a really uh, enthusiastic effort right. uh, with an uh, intent really of significantly improving uh, outcomes for triple negative breast cancer. Very good. And one of the things that I, I say constantly at breastcanceranswers.com is that the care of breast cancer is very multidisciplinary. Mm -hmm. We all need to come together. And what you've been describing for us at the MD Anderson is just that sort of approach. Yeah, the moonshot effort actually a, 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 addresses the entire cancer care continuum, which is the fancy word we use there, yeah. uh, which means we want to detect it earlier. We want to try to prevent it if, yep. uh, as much as possible. We want to treat it better the first time around, giving the the, the right treatment for each uh, each specific tumor type, and ultimately, you know, have survivorship issues so we have, you know, can monitor and okay. minimize toxicity. Very good. Well, Funda, I look forward to seeing you at our American Society of Breast Surgeons meeting Sounds good. soon. Always lovely uh, to see you. Uh, oh, and listen, ditto. And we really appreciate you coming in today. I get excited every time I see your enthusiasm, and I know the world out there is very hopeful and enthusiastic about what you're doing with the moonshot. Thanks for Thank coming you. by. Okay. Todd, I'll turn it back to you. Well, she's Funda Merrick Bernstrom from MD Anderson Cancer Center, and we're reporting live right now from the uh, San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium. This is our last hour we're doing at the top of the hour, but we're bringing you really compelling stories and information that as a patient, an advocate, or a loved one can help advance, well, not only awareness, but also your, your care or your loved one's care. Now, I'd, I'd like to thank a couple of groups that have been instrumental in helping us pull this off. Of course, I'd like to thank our sponsor, our sponsor, Genomic Health, the creator of the Oncotype DX test. Genomic Health is a global healthcare company that provides actionable genomic information to personalize cancer treatment decisions. And we thank them very much for making this broadcast possible. On top of that, I'd like to thank the Breast Cancer Site and uh, the breastcancersite.com and also the National Consortium of Breast Centers for posting these live video feeds and also the team at Breast Cancer Answers that's making all of this happen behind the scenes. Now, behind me right now 
is, and, and Dr. Harness, I know you're well aware of this, but right now you are sitting with the first patient advocate to plan and moderate a session at the San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium. You're joined by Susan Raff. She's the founder and uh, survivor, but she's the founder of the Pink Ribbons Project, Dr. Jay Harness and Susan Raff. I'm going to shake your hand again and welcome you again, Susan. It's funny I think what that, you get famous for. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, tell us about the session. Tell us about the, the Pink Ribbon Foundation. It's all yours. Well, um, I am an 18-year survivor of breast cancer, uh, about a 17-year survivor of metastatic disease. And uh, in February, I will celebrate my 16th second birthday to my stem cells. I always get two birthdays a year. So Good for you. Uh, I did a stem cell transplant. And... Um, my sister, uh, paralleling all of that, uh, started Pink Ribbons Project in New York. She was a dancer in New York, and uh, when I was really going through the thick of it, she actually thought she was giving up her dance career and moved down here. And in a very drug-induced state of, you know, I said, "Let's bring the project to Houston." So we did that in 1998, and she ran it for several years, and then she handed the baton off to me because she had other things. Um, that she wanted to do, work with kids at risk using the dance. And so I took it over. And um, we've been a, a, a noisy, a small, I don't think noisy, a, a nice small group in Houston. Our, our funds stay in the community. Um, so do you work with the MD Anderson folks then? I, or just I do. Yeah. Oh, no, I, I absolutely do. Um, as an organization, Pink Ribbons Project, I think, stays fairly neutral. And I think that's how I was treated at MD Anderson. Um, in fact, the, the Osborne group wasn't even in the city when I was diagnosed back in 1994. Uh, but I, um, all, my, all my treatment was at Anderson, and I spent a lot of time volunteering and giving back to MD Anderson. So I'm a, a help start a kind of peer-to-peer on-site support group, or support at MD Anderson in the breast clinic, and I, we're called Pink Ribbon Volunteers, totally separate from Pink Ribbons Project. Wow. And been doing that. I, I do their Anderson Network telephone peer peer to peer support. I'm a tour ambassador for them. Um, but I, I had this community organization, Pink Ribbons Project, and um, met Kent Osborne and Dr. Elledge when they first came to town, and uh, really stayed, you know, as I said, we stayed neutral and didn't align with, align with anybody. And I think it was in, I was trying to remember, I think it was in 2006, he asked me to be their, one of their advocates on the breast spore. Okay. So that's when I first made the launch into kind of more of the research arena. The, wow. the, the history behind Pink Ribbons Project has a very research-oriented okay. component to it, but I can't say I was one of the women down at the FDA testifying on Taxotere and Arimidex and, and Permidronate, which are the three drugs that got pushed through by the monies that we originally gave them. Well, but but wow. down the road, um, I have been sitting at these research committee tables for six years, and it's, it's all starting to sink in. I have no science background, so it's taken me a lot longer. Oh. And uh, from there, I've been asked to be on the Translational Breast Cancer Research Consortium. And three years ago, I was asked to be part of the planning committee for the San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium. Okay, well, congratulations. Now, what kind of sessions are, have been going on or are going on here at San Antonio looking at breast cancer survivors? So <clears throat> in, this is probably, I think it's my fifth year to attend. And so the, there is this level of, um, of always there's a component of survivorship or um, epidemiology studies that are, I think, always of interest. To me, they are of interest. So as a, I think I speak for advocates, those are very important. The science is always very important, and, and you know, the basic science is, you know, over my head, but I, I love going in and hearing about it. Um, but we also really want to dig our claws into survivorship issues. So I don't know. I think each time, and since they've added the educational sessions, they've been able to add more to... What, what would you say are the top two or three survivor issues? Oh, you're out, you're now wow. out 18 years. You're really getting me on this one. Uh, well, it's okay, because so, I have a big interest well, in Well, and, and I guess, 
I will say, and what probably made my voice kind of stand out when there was the little contingent in the planning committee last um, February saying, There's, we got to keep the survivorship issue on the table. I was yelling for sexual intimacy and sexual okay. Um, okay. Um, dysfunction that happens. And do you know Michael Kreitzman? Well, he, that he was on my panel. All right. And one of the reasons you're here is because of Michael. Todd's just looking at me. Well, uh, Todd, oh, there you uh, go. Mike, Michael is also on our Breast Cancer Answers. Okay. Uh, dot com uh, website. So I admit, uh, I'm also chair of the Breast Health Collaborative of Texas, which is fairly, um, it, it, it's been around about six years, and it, it, we do a summit annually, and it came to us from the chair of the, our annual summit, who was, is a nurse, mm -hmm. who heard him speak at the ONS conference, right. and we asked him to be our keynote two years ago at our summit. Okay. So when I was asked to do this panel, I said, I'm going to invite Michael Critchman. Yeah. So, yes, I do yeah, know. He, he was here a couple of days ago, and, and like a stealth bomber came in, did his thing, and went out. I was hoping he, I came in Tuesday night, and I think Michael had already left at that point. I did, so, no, yeah. he didn't. I, I actually had dinner with him after the session. Oh, did you? Okay. Very, very great guy. And, um, yeah, so, so that, that was one of our okay. topics. I okay. also so brought sexual in, intimacy uh, for the long-term survivor is, is one of the important ones. Uh, yeah, I, I think in, in, in listening and talking to Dr. Black, um, I struggle with lymphedema. So lymphedema is always an issue uh, for post-surgery patients. Okay. Long-term, I have it under control, but I know that is a very big issue. Having said that, when I was asked to moderate the, and set up the session, um, I had a very big cohort behind me, Dr. Uh, Eric Weiner, yes. Mo Romali, um, Amelie Ramirez, Melissa Bondi, and and Sandra um, Stanford, Stanford from uh, Alamo. They were kind of behind me, helping me push forward on the three topics. And it was suggested that we do something about the cognitive issues. So we invited Patricia Gans yes. to be on the panel. Okay. And then another topic that is also not very talked about is the secondary cancers or secondary primary in so, um, in other words, let's uh, uh, stop for one second yeah. and share with the folks at home that if you've had one cancer other than maybe a simple skin cancer, we don't know why, but your risk of having a separate, different right. cancer has, has gone up. Exactly. Yeah. And there, the, there is the biology that, you know, there's groups that are higher risk based on their biology right. of, of having that second cancer, having a leukemia or MDS or even a, a, another primary in the breast you know, based sure. on radiation, and, sure. and so we asked Janine Bernstein to present on her We Care program, and unfortunately she couldn't make it. She was very disappointed, but her uh, former professor and um, uh, friend and person she works with, Leslie Bernstein, oh, not yeah. related, yeah. ended up presenting her work for her. Oh, so um, I think um, I, I was thrilled to see how many people were in the room. I think the Tuesday sessions are really growing. People are coming up earlier now, and it was filled with, and I think the exciting part was, I knew a lot of advocates were gonna be there, but I think there are a lot of physicians in the room, and I've yeah. actually talked to some since, yeah. and I'm, I, I have to say, I, that yeah. helped me validate. I, I must admit, we had the assignment of doing these live broadcasts uh, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, so I came in Tuesday night um, had I realized that Michael and your panel was on, I would have been one of those physicians in the audience, and I just sort of, sort of missed that, uh, you know, uh, in getting ready for this meeting. But one of my areas of interest, let me just share this with you, one of my areas of interest is my experience, I've been focused on breast cancer for 27 years, mm -hmm. and many of my patients have said a couple things to me. One is, my life is forever changed. No matter what. Yeah, the, the, uh, uh, right. there's a new normal. Uh, yeah. yeah, there's no, a new normal, and Whatever it's not is. the old normal, right. particularly for husbands and people who think, right. well, you're all done with that. Let's just get back to our normal life, right? Exactly. It never happens. And number two, sort of this feeling of it's like running the Boston Marathon. You finish the race of the initial diagnosis, various aspects of treatment, surgery chemotherapy, radiation therapy, reconstruction. Sometimes it's a year out after you're done with all this, and it's sort of like finishing the race, and you're looking around and now what? Right. 
You know, where, where are all those appointments that I had and all those doctors and nurses and navigators? Exactly. Uh, I think there, I agree with all the issues you listed, but I also think there's an issue of assisting people with that aspect of their life too. What are your, what are your thoughts well, about that? Well, I, I was asked by Dr. Singletary years ago uh, with a, a, another survivor and a nurse practitioner to write a chapter on survivorship. And there is this, um, you, the umbilical cord has been severed and everybody around you, for the most part, wants you to be back to being the mom, right. walking the dog, taking the garbage out, whatever it is, I mean, it, it, kids to school, all those things have to fall back into place, and yet, emotionally, physically, you might be there. Your hair's grown in. Your reconstruction is healed. All those the things have healed, but the emotional aspect is still. Eighteen years later, I still have issues that there will come up, and and that's I think where it used to be. You know, we worry about saving you, and then they saw. Wait, we've got to start looking at prevention. I think now there's got to be a, a, a shift to looking at survivorship issues, and it stages out. My issues at 18 years out are quite different from 18 months out. That is exactly and correct. And so yeah. it's, it's getting some focus, and of course with focus you need dollars, so getting funding to look at survivorship well, but you, issues. Well, one of the people we had on here, I guess it was yesterday, uh, has organized an incredible program at the University of Kansas. Yes, and I met her through Dr. Krishnan. Yes, exactly. Michael. Deborah. I've decided, Todd, that Michael is our main focus of the most <laughs> interesting people on the planet. She was at dinner with us, yes. Yeah, and yeah. I, she has. Yeah. Yes, right. and, and she has quite a robust survivorship oh, plan my going. Goodness. I, I told her she's just become one of my new best friends, and before you get out of here, I need to know how to get a hold okay. of you, too, I will, all right? I have that uh, because I do want to follow up. I live in Southern California, but as I look at the uh, next level of focus in my career, it's going to be on the things that we're talking about here. Today. Well, and I think everybody's going to have to wake up here because yeah. there is going to be a mandate. In 2015, survivorship plans have to happen. And what do those look like and how they're going to roll out? Um, I think institutions need to be focusing, you know, and I know money, dollars are short, but that day's coming, and you certainly don't want to be worrying about that in the fourth quarter of 2014 and thinking, oh, my gosh, we have to have a survivorship plan yep. because there is, there's a, 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 you've got to ramp up to what a good survivorship program looks like. Exactly. Listen, so. Susan, what an absolute pleasure. The planet is lucky to have oh, you. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah, be sure and leave with uh, our staff here. I will. How I can best get a hold of you. I will I absolutely do that. You, okay? Thank you for the time. Oh, thank you. Todd, back to you. Well, thank you, Dr. Harness. Um, an exciting morning we have here. I got to tell you, there's something really cool that happens when you get to be surrounded by people that are doing really compelling things in the world of, well, I would say cancer, but really compelling things in the world of saving lives and enhancing lives in the process. A super cool opportunity for me. And now we're joined by Randy Stevens, chair of NAB, NAPBC, Education and Dissemination. She's sitting down right now with Dr. Jay Harness. So, Todd, we... and accredit all kinds of breast centers across the country, from your private practitioners that are a little tiny group to big tertiary care medical centers, and make sure that we're all delivering a standard of excellent breast care for our patients in a very multidisciplinary fashion. And um, Cindy Bergen's here with you today as well, who is uh, one of the, you know, in every organization, there's one or two people who are what I call the key people. And guess what? It's not the doctors. You are exactly correct. <laughs> and it is Cindy Bergen. You are correct. And Cindy's and her sitting staff. right over there and her staff. Exactly. 
exactly correct. As you know, I've been involved with NAPVC since the beginning. I'm no longer on the board, but I'm a surveyor, and I'm really proud of the effort. And I cannot uh, talk about NAPVC and not talk about Dave Winchester's vision to make all of this happen and all the struggles he had getting it up. But now that we're up and going, it's unbelievable. How, it is fantastic. And how many centers uh, do we have accredited? Well, it's really taken on a life of its own. There are over 450 accredited centers at this point. We have about another 120 waiting to be accredited. Wow. And our first set who finished their accreditation, because if you pass with flying colors, you can be accredited for three full years, they are now coming up for reaccreditation. So the surveyors are back out in the field looking at these programs again to make sure that their standards are still being met and that the quality care we want for all of our patients is being met. So the folks sitting at home, are, you know, we're streaming this live over uh, NCBC's website, Breast Cancer Answers website, uh, another one or two websites, they're probably saying to themselves, how do I find out if where I go is NAPBC accredited? Do we have a sort of a list of we do. who, of who we well, do. and is it accessible to the public? It is. It, you know, this is all for the patient. This is so that our patients, whether they're in a rural place in Iowa or a major medical center in Los Angeles, that these patients can know that they're going to get great care if they go there. So we have the NAPBC website. It is its own website. But also, you will see our logo, which I will have Cindy send to you. Okay. And it is a trademark logo, and the patient should look for that logo. So they can look for an NAPBC center near them on the website. They also can look when they go into their breast imaging department or into their hospital or into their center and look to see we provide them with certificates that most of the programs display prominently. Yes, they do. I, I, and I think people are very, very proud of, uh, uh, as a surveyor, I know there's not only sort of a sigh of relief that they were accredited, but there's a great passion and joy that they're accredited. So. Ab absolutely. The people that do this, they want to show the patients, their colleagues, yeah. and the payers that they're delivering this great quality care. And I think, as you and I are both surveyors, we both know that the work that goes into becoming accredited, almost every program says they have gotten better and they are a better breast center because of all the standards the NAPBC requires and what they have had to uh, make sure they're delivering. And it's really exciting to see all of the different things that are out there for the patients. Boy, I really, I really agree. So in summary then, what's the best way to sort of summarize, what's the take home message that the folks, again, NAPBC stands for National Accreditation Program for Breast Centers. Any final thoughts that you'd, that you'd like to uh, share? I think uh, if, you, if you find an accredited center, which you all should look for, you want yeah. to go to an accredited breast center, yep. you can be comfortable that you are getting that superb level of care that you deserve. And in it, it's not just about the medicine, it's about all of the support services and the other programs and the prevention and the genetic testing, the screening that we all want to have. Well, I'm sure glad that you're chair of a really important committee that we have because uh, Cindy said when we were talking about this the other day, we needed to get you here because you can really deliver the message and so articulate. Thank you so very, very much you're for very taking welcome. your Thank valuable you for time us. for coming by, okay? Tally ho, thanks. Todd, back to you. Well, that was Randy Stevens, the chair of NAPBC's Education and Dissemination Committee. And, um, you know, while we're here in San Antonio, I think it's a pretty good time for patients and loved ones to recognize there are thousands of people here, research scientists, uh, physicians, a whole variety, you know, the whole gamut of people that are working to advance patient care and our, um, and so if you look over it's, it's about 43 percent medical doctors 12 percent research scientists and they come from 133 countries all devoted to one cause which is making sure that we can advance the level of patient care and save lives and uh, from breast cancer answers you know our focus is to help educate as many patients as possible in the last year we've had 6.3 million video views of our content and we couldn't be more honored to help share this news and information with you. Now sitting down behind me 
is, uh, is Nina Bissell. She, Dr. Bissell is a world-recognized leader in the area of the role of extracellular matrix, ECM, and microenvironment in the regulation of tissue-specific function, with special emphasis on breast cancer. And they're going to be talking about genes and the microenvironment and the twosome of gene expression and breast cancer. Really cool conversation. By the way, um, Dr. Bissell, we had yesterday we had um, Nellie Pollock here who received the Outstanding Investigator Award and um, and you were also a presenter for the Distinguished Lectureship in Breast Cancer Research. Research. Thank you for joining us. My pleasure. Dr. Harness, I'll turn it yeah, over to the so two of you. Are you located in Berkeley then? Yes. Oh. I'm at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. Well, I know about that place because mm -hmm. I lived in the East Bay for 12 years. All oh, right. I was part of the UCSF East Bay Department of Surgery mm -hmm. program mm -hmm. uh, over in Oakland. So oh, right. I, I know the area well. Yes. And other friends at uh, Cal Berkeley and whatever. Very good. So Very good. How in the world, and, and you said to me just as you were sitting down, I'm really tired. I'm exhausted. I just gave a major <laughs> talk here at the meeting, but I noticed that we fed you, or you brought some food along with you. <laughs> somebody so else helped somebody me out. Somebody got some food, so we at least have a little glucose circulating. <laughs> yes. You can hang in here with me for about seven or eight minutes. I sure. Think we'll, we'll be all sure. Set. I'm used to this. Ah, there you go. Yeah. So how? So our audience right now that's watching this and is being streamed out over three different websites, <clears throat> plus we'll upload the videos later, um, they may not be familiar with what genes and microenvironments are. How can we bring this, uh, how can you mm -hmm. explain this in, in mm -hmm. sort of layman's terms? If you will? Well, you know, I would say if anybody gets interested in what I have to say, they should watch a talk I gave called a TED Talk. I gave a TED oh, Global TED Talk, talk. Sure, yes. right. and it's in YouTube, it's right. live, it's okay. only 17 minutes, okay. and I gave that for a general audience, okay, and I right. think if they watch that, they will get okay. the gist of what so I'm trying to say. All right, that's the long version. Mm -hmm. How about the short version with the okay. J Talk? The short version <laughs> has to do with the fact that you have somewhere between 10 trillion and 70 trillion cells in your body. Imagine how much. I don't think you knew that before, right? And that I don't you're right. and I don't know who counted them. But that's what we have. Now every one of those cells have the same genetic information. Yes. Did you know that? I did. So why do you think your nose is different from your mouth? Because of the genes. No. No. Genes are the same here oh. and here. Excuse oh. Oh, me. Oh I'm sorry, different. Okay. I mean oh well, tell me, what's the answer? The microenvironment. Ah, okay, right, so good. that question, every time you look at yourself in a mirror, uh -huh. there you look and you say, boy, look what evolution has brought to me. Okay. My nose, my mouth, my eyes, my finger, the breast, the prostate, and the guys, you know, so yeah. they would listen, is the same genetic information. Now, when your mom and dad meet and you're born, you have a unique genetic information. Correct. And the way your nose looks comes from the two of mixture. But the cells in your body all have the same genetic information. Yes. So why that's nobody had... That's unique to you, right? That is unique to, to you. you. Right. As yeah. unique to you, right. but is the same in every trillions and trillions of cells of your body. Right. So, yes, <laughs> exactly. So uh, it, was, it was a very moving talk. I had one young lady come and she was weeping and she said, you made me so excited, I'm crying. And I had never seen that one before, oh, yeah. so I must yeah. have done a good job. But, there you go. <clears throat> but here is the story. So if you take cells from your skin or your prostate or your liver and you put them in a dish, as most scientists do, they completely forget where they came from. Okay. Okay? Now, Tumor cells don't forget where they came from. They still act like a tumor. But normal cells, if you take a cell from a mammary gland that was making milk, you put it in a dish, completely forgets to make milk, and it looks like something else. So it says that it is not a determined trait that it wants a mammary And that's why I got this award, and that's why I get other awards now after 25, 30 years that people thought I was crazy, now they give me a lot of awards because they realize I was correct. That this simple view of cancer, 
that there is this gene or that gene or whatever. You can treat those and you can get a little bit better, but you don't cure cancer. You have to pay attention to what's outside the tumor as well as what's inside. So that, that leads me, one of the things I've been telling uh, patients for years and years, I've been focused on breast cancer for 27 years. Mm -hmm. Most of my career was at the University of Michigan uh, mm -hmm. within the UC system. Um, one of the things I've been telling my patients is the importance of living a heart healthy life, not only beforehand, but certainly after the diagnosis of breast Keeps cancer. Keeps your microenvironment there alert. You there you go. So. Exercise is the best and the biggest cancer cure wow. before and after. It's true. Yes. It does better, you know, if, if people who have colon cancer, if they had exercised before, they would have had 40% less chance of getting cancer. If you're not obese, you have a very much less chance of getting cancer, and especially breast cancer. Yes. So, it, you know, they ask me, a lot of young people ask me, Dr. Bissell, give us one advice, and I say to them, if I don't know how to tell you to run your lab, I don't know how to do this, but if I give you an advice, will you take it? Because it will help you do good science, stay in good shape. I am a lot older than people usually realize. Mm -hmm. I have a 48-year-old daughter. Mm -hmm. I have four grandchildren. Uh -huh. I have a big lab, and I still have a lot of energy because I, I, eat, yeah. I eat well yes. and I exercise. Okay. And I am going to say something controversial that a lot of doctors don't like to hear. It is not estrogen that is the culprit. It is progesterone. No, no, that one. And, I'm, I'm and that they, one when people equate hormone therapy with estrogen therapy, they're wrong. No, you they need don't. estrogen for your skin. You need estrogen for your microenvironment. You right, need estrogen right. for your brain you don't function. Need the progesterone, you yeah. don't need the progesterone. And unfortunately, if you don't take it and you have your uterus, you could have a little trouble 20 years later. But meanwhile, you're doing fine. Okay. So. This is uh, the short and long of it. All right. Well, very <laughs> right. good. Any other final thoughts as we wrap up here? Yes. I mean, uh, what I've just said about being heart healthy, any dietary things that you've learned? In well, you know, a lot, of, a lot of these things that people have said, like broccoli, this, that, right. green, dark, whatever, right. it's all true. Yeah. And uh, the, the only problem is that people don't want to take responsibility for their additional uh, causes of breast cancer, right. and they really should. Yeah. And uh, this view of cancer that I have is a hopeful view of cancer, and we have shown it. We can take malignant cells and make them normal uh -huh. in a three-dimensional assay, uh -huh. and if we inject those cells into the animal, they don't make tumor. Wow. Okay? In interesting. A real human cancer cell. So. Oh, okay. All right. All right. Well, don't is jump. No, don't no? jump up uh, quite yet. All right. So I want to reach out and congratulate you. Thank you. All right. Your energy is boundless. Thank you. Thank you for all the hard work that you're doing and thank all the you. contributions that you've made. It's a pleasure. And thank you for being here with us today. Sure. Okay. It's a pleasure. Todd, are you going to? I love what I do. I can tell that. <laughs> I love, Lots of passion. I love passionate people who love what they do. Yes. Okay? Thank right. you. Bye bye. All right. Bye bye. Oh my goodness, I'm all energized now. This is just really uh, absolutely fantastic. Todd's going to come on over here and sit down with me uh, here as we sort of wrap things up, huh? Well, we've done three days of live broadcasts. Yes, sir. Maybe. Yeah, ladies, ladies if we, we're still on the air, so if you can just hold on moments. for one second. So we did three days of live broadcasts, three hours a day, a total of nine hours, maybe three or four or five interviews an hour. Right. Um, I'm not going to do the math, but you didn't get to sit in on as many uh, presentations as you would like, but you definitely got to speak with the presenters. Right. Can I get you to give us a big takeaway? What is for the audience, for the, the people that are at home watching this, are we winning the fight against breast cancer? Are we getting closer? Yeah, the answer is yes. Um, and I'm going to look at the folks at home. Um, every time I come to a meeting like this, I become even more hopeful. Uh, one of the messages that we've gotten, Todd, here over this past few days is that breast cancer is a very complex set of diseases. There are really multiple diseases. Uh, it's very complex down at the molecular level. When we have the kind of people who we've been interviewing here, 
who are passionate, who are excited about what they're doing. It, it gives all of us hope. Now, um, is this going to, well, let me go back as an example to when Richard Nixon was president. He took uh, the parallel of the moonshot when he was president in the 70s and said by you know the end of the century, we will have cured cancer. That was overly optimistic because as we're learning, cancer is such a really complex set of diseases at the molecular level, what regulates things, you know, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But the people that we have interviewed here have given me more hope than anything. And you're right, I wasn't able to be down at all. But they all, all came session. to visit you. But they all came <laughs> to visit us and they shared with us the snippets of, of what they're doing. Yeah. And absolutely, I think the future is tremendously It's open. amazing. Yeah, it really is. It's been a fabulous uh, three days. We want to take this opportunity to once again thank Genomic Health right. for uh, having us uh, believing in breastcanceranswers.com for a starter, and number two, being creative enough to uh, support this effort of our live streaming and then uploading our videos to uh, youtube.com forward slash genomic health to breast cancer answers and, and really getting information out there. What we have learned is over this past year of breastcanceranswers.com is that people really like being communicated to in video uh, and it's something that they can share time and time again with other family members and other friends. So, That's great. Okay. Well, Dr. Harness, thank you very much for all of your work. Well, Todd Hartley, this I've, been a lot of fun. I've been shaking everybody else's hand. <laughs> I'm going to shake yours for trying to make all this happen, the technical issues we've been dealing it's with. It's been and, crazy. And it's been crazy, but yeah. I, I feel good about it. So. Well, on behalf of the Breast Cancer Answers team, we'd like to thank, again, as you mentioned, we'd like to thank Genomic Health and the Oncotype DX test for making this broadcast opportunity possible. And we will look forward to getting your feedback. The videos will be available on YouTube and uh, also on Breast Cancer Answer. So we'll look forward to getting your feedback and creating more content that advances your lives going forward. So on behalf of Jay Harness and myself, we're signing off from San Antonio and wishing you the very best of health. Oh, wait. I'm the person that's got to go, go away to the computer yes. time and sign us off. You've got to remember that, okay? All right. We're signing off from San Antonio. All right.